The following program compresses a great deal of valuable and practical information into a limited viewing time. We at L.L. Bean want you to get the most from this program, which has been designed for repeated viewing. We encourage you to use the various functions of your VCR, such as pause, search, and freeze frame, to closely study what you see. Additionally, we suggest you review the owner's manual, which came with your camera. It's a valuable source of information. A suggested photography reading list can be found in the program credits. In this introduction to outdoor photography, we will cover light and how to use it, composition, basic equipment, slide storage, accessories. You'll also become part of a series of practical outdoor exercises as your teacher, Lefty Cray, works with a class of outdoor photography students. If you have questions or comments about this program, direct them to the L.L. Bean Customer Service Department, Freeport, Maine, 04033. Lefty Cray is doing what comes naturally to him, working in the outdoors, taking photographs, in this instance, along the coast of Maine. In a career spanning more than three decades, he has developed and honed his skills, choosing to concentrate on the world of outdoor photography. Growing up in the mountains of western Maryland, fishing, hunting, and living in an outdoor environment were an integral part of his life. He learned the art of fly fishing and mastered the skills of fly tying. He became an outdoor writer and photographer. But of all the things he does, photography remains his favorite. I find that photography is far, far more challenging and in many, many ways far more satisfying. When things are more difficult to do and you're doing well, then you get a lot of fun out. But I think the other thing too is you can always look at what you did later. I have felt for years that uh, outdoor photography is by far the most challenging of all types of photography. Uh, you can have light one minute that's gone the next. Uh, the weather changes, wind can cause problems, a dead calm and fog can cause problems. Everything is constantly changing, and what you have to learn to do is adjust to those changes. I learn all the time. In fact, I have a saying that uh, if you're satisfied with the pictures that you took last year, there's something wrong with your photography. Lefty is active in outdoor preservation efforts and works to improve our environment. He has taken pictures all around the world from shots of bonefish in the Christmas Islands to Kodiak bears in Alaska. He's recorded thousands of memorable moments, but never tires of searching for and finding new ones. Anybody who loves photography never ceases to thrill at taking a good photograph, particularly wildlife photographs are so stimulating because no two wildlife photographs are quite the same. Uh, every the pose on the animal, the background, the habitat, the light, every shot. In fact, on the same roll, not by design, but, but if you just take the photographs, you'll end up with four or five different pictures of the same deer. Maybe the deer's taking brows off the end of a limb. It might be looking at you or looking up the hill or stepping over a log. So it, everything is different. And knowing how difficult sometimes, like we were, I was very lucky to be able to get down and crawl up on those two little seal pups before they, they rushed away. Uh, you kind of treasure those moments. You kind of thank God you had a chance to take that picture. Lefty is not content to simply take outdoor photographs. 
He spends a great deal of his time teaching others how to do the same and how to improve their skills. He conducts seminars and clinics for L.L. Bean, has taught advanced nature photography for the National Wildlife Federation and wildflower photography for the North Carolina Forestry Department. Uh, if I had a favorite form, it probably would be uh, wildflower photography because most people never see wildflowers. They look at them from 6 to 10, 15 feet away. And uh, a deer close up with a telephoto is still a deer and looks like a deer. But when, when you get down and really look at lots of flowers, uh, they are so intricate. One of the things that I urge people to do who are going to get into wildlife and outdoor photography is to buy field guides and manuals and try to learn more about the things they're going to photograph. If you just say to somebody, this is a wild ginger flower and go on to the next flower, you've really lost all the fun for yourself and them. You know, I really love the outdoors, and one of the ways of getting a lot more pleasure out outdoors is to take photographs. Not only can you relive the memories by looking at those pictures, but you can share them with other people. We're going to concentrate on 35 millimeter color photography, and we get kind of nutty if you start taking a lot of photographs. And a good story that illustrates that is about two photographers that were walking through the bush, and a grizzly bear charged. One of them said, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? And the other one said, I don't know, but one of us is going to get a great photograph. You know, I guess I've taken 100,000 photographs in my lifetime. I've made my share of mistakes and I've thrown away a lot of bad pictures. But I've learned from each of those mistakes. You can learn from yours and become a better photographer in the process. Light is the foundation of all photography, and outdoors light changes all the time. And it really offers a challenge, and it also offers an opportunity, because how we use that light is one of our most important tools. Use light to give impact or to highlight your subjects. A light subject against a light background is all right, but the same Queen Anne's lace really stands out when photographed against a dark background. The reverse is also true, and here, color is used to separate subject from background. Here's the same idea again. The dark water turkey stands out against the pale background. Silhouettes are a variation on the same theme, but in order for them to work, you've got to have a three f-stop difference between your dark subject and the lighter background. Meter on the background, because you want it to be properly exposed and the subject very dark. I feel some of the best light is found in early morning or late afternoon. You get warm tones, the reds and yellows coming through the strongest. You're also working with angled light, which creates distinct shadows, adding texture and depth to your pictures. When a storm is in the background and light falls on the subject in the foreground, you can get a dramatic photo. In color photography, the key to proper film exposure is to meter on something light that's important to the shot. In this case, the angler's face and fly fishing vest. Now, by walking a short distance to the side and changing the front light to back light on the angler, I got a very different picture. Just look at what light does. First, with side light on the fisherman, then, moving behind him, the strong back light changes everything. All I've done is to change the angle and direction of light hitting him. Another example, this egret is standing at the edge of light and dark backgrounds. Moving just a few feet to one side, the bird shows poorly against the bright water. Moving to the opposite side, I've really made the egret stand out. It's a light subject against a dark background. Ordinary objects can look very different depending upon whether you shoot them with front light or back light. For example, a plastic fishing worm. Fall foliage is especially stunning with strong backlight. Remember, meter on something important that's light in color. 
Don't put your camera away just because the sun isn't shining. On overcast, even rainy days, colors are enriched. Light subjects, such as this laurel or these rainbow trout, show their subtle colors when no bright glaring light hits them. Even fog can be used to create a pleasing photograph. Some subjects, such as these Indian pipes, naturally grow in low light. They'd look out of place shot with bright light, so don't use flash. However, a touch of flash sometimes helps. Here's a May apple shot with available light. Now the same flower with flash, held about two feet away. But you have to be careful to use the right amount of flash. Too much in this case has washed out the fisherman. No flash leaves him in the dark. Good flash fill never looks like it was used. Check your camera manual for more on flash fill. You know, everyone loves to take sunrise and sunset pictures, but to get good results takes a little special attention. The lens should be extra clean because dust will refract light, producing unwanted flare. Long lenses enlarge the sun and the colorful area around it. However, you can't take a good sunrise or sunset if you have to squint when you look at the sun. To get a good exposure, meter at a point about one-third of the distance from the sun to the edge of the picture. Metering further away produces an overexposed or washed out picture. Metering closer to the sun produces an underexposed or darker shot. Metering directly on the sun itself can poison your meter, resulting in improper readings for a short time after. Looking at the sun too long can also be harmful to your eyes. Experiment to see what exposure pleases you. Don't just shoot the sun, but include a point of interest in the foreground. You know, you may wonder how a professional photographer gets such really super exposures. The truth is he brackets. Bracketing is making a meter reading with color film that you think's right. And right now, I've determined that F11 is the right exposure. So I'll shoot that shot. Now, to bracket, I move a half stop below or overexposed, and I shoot that. I go back to F11, and I move a half a stop on underexposure, and I shoot that. What I've done has gotten, I know, one good shot, one that's pretty good, and one to probably have to throw away. Any time that you're shooting color film and you've got a very important shot, always bracket a half stop over and under what you think is the right exposure.